Good evening, church family. Uh, Pastor Danny Evans here. Uh, consider it another wonderful opportunity to be able to come and to spend a few moments in the quietness of the evening to uh, look at some very important things in God's Word uh, that we as believers need to focus on tonight. I'm going to be focusing sp specifically, primarily on us as believers tonight uh, as far as the responsibility that we have and we're going to be talking about uh, uh, the believer's sanctification tonight. But before we do that, as always, we need to prepare our hearts. So just bow with me as I open us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do truly thank you for the opportunity that we have to come before your throne of grace. As believers, uh, it's a privilege for us to be able to study your word, to be taught by your Holy Spirit, and to have the opportunity to live a life that's pleasing to you. Where all the things of the world are passed aside and our focus is on you, our Heavenly Father, and for the will that you have for our lives. I pray, dear Father, that we as believers may take the word tonight <clears throat> that you've given us and apply in our lives and understand the urgency of us being sanctified before you and then if there be any out there tonight that don't know you as Lord and Savior, as always, the plea is to you to accept Christ as Lord and Savior for us everlasting too late. For us in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I hope everyone's had a wonderful day today uh, from the morning services uh, throughout the day, getting rest and spending time with the family possibly. Uh, but, you know, tonight we come back and, like I say, we're going to talk about, just for a few minutes tonight, uh, the believer's sanctification and God's desire for that. Over in First Thessalonians, um, it gives us a little insight about the will of the Father there. And I just want to read that first part of that verse, because that's all that uh, is necessary at this particular time. First uh, Thessalonians 4, uh, 3a. Bear with me. Uh, everything's sticking together tonight, but that's okay. Here we go. He says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So as Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica about the need, what God's desire is for us to be sanctified, we may have heard different things. You know, there's, there's the church of the sanctification of believers, and there's different types of things going around. Uh, sometimes you even hear this term as being for those people that are holier than thou. But I want to give us the understanding of what God's Word says about that word sanctification. And if you look it up in the original Greek, it's only mentioned five times in the New Testament, but it's hagiasmos. And the definition for that is purity or holiness. Now, those are two very powerful words when you think of purity and holiness. You know, purity, we talk about so many times as that water that comes from that deep spring or that uh, up in the mountains, and how clear it is, no impurities in it whatsoever. Um uh, or, you know, the, uh, the diamond, how beautiful it is once it's been touched by the jeweler and, you know, it has that clarity about it. But then we think of that word holiness. And the only way you can define that word holiness or compare that is when you take that and visualize that as far as God is concerned. Because God is the perfect image of holiness and if we see here in the scriptures, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, that it is his desire, it is his will that we be sanctified before him, that's pretty important. You know, salvation is just the beginning of a long journey that we have on this earth as we strive each and every day of our life to be holy and pleasing and righteous before God. To be sanctified, to be sanctified before Him, and and I think about that word, and, and I think about how we need to break that down, because there's three different areas of sanctification, uh, and, and we'll talk about these individually: a positional, uh, experiential, 
sanctification, and then the ultimate sanctification. All three are the same, but as we look through God's Word, as we look through the learning, uh, the teaching of God's Word, we understand that there's a purpose behind each of these and that we need to understand that. So the positional truth of sanctification is this. At that point in time, when we as a human being accept Christ as Lord and Savior, at that very moment in time, we are sanctified. Paul speaks over in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. You know, bear with me so I get over to that. What he tells us here, and he says this to the church of Corinth, and to the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. This is that positional sanctification that I was referring to, as, as Paul mentions that here, as he's speaking to the church in Corinth, specifically to the believers, which is the church, called to be saints. The saints are people that are dead and gone on to be with the Lord. Saints are those individuals like us that have been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're to strive to have this sanctification on a daily basis. Not temporal, but on a daily basis. But also Hebrews 10.10 10 shares a little bit more about that. He says, by which will we are will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, if it had not been for Jesus Christ coming, living the perfect life, dying on the cross, and giving his life for us, we would not have the opportunity to have a sanctified life. To be able to stand in this positional truth of sanctification here the way God desired for it. But as always, God is perfect. God makes no errors. And he laid it out exactly how it needed to be as far as this positional sanctification was concerned. And it was all completed by Jesus Christ, by all that he'd done on this earth, his death, burial, resurrection, and then ascension after 40 days into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, made this positional truth possible. But then we look at the experiential truth, and we're going to talk more in detail about this at the end of the sermon, but I just want to break this down real quick. In Ephesians 5, 26, he gives us a, a, a comment that we need to look at here in the scriptures. He says, though he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now here is Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus. He's referring to spiritual growth. Each and every day of our life as a believer, we need to strive to be sanctified through spiritual growth. Spiritual growth are those things that we talk about quite often, studying God's Word, being taught by the Holy Spirit daily, not just on Sundays and Wednesdays, but daily. Our efforts to seek out the Holy Spirit, seek out His guidance through everything that we do in our lives. Again, so very important that we do that. And Paul, you know, he explains and, and wants us to understand that, that this is something that's important. You know, we talk about the maturity of the believer from time to time here at the church. And what exactly is that? You know, we are to strive to meet the mark of the high calling of God which means that after the point of salvation, when we were a babe in Christ, we start off with the milk, as the scriptures teach us. And then as we study and as we learn and as we grow, we begin to start eating bread. Okay? But after a while, as we grow and, and we, we continue to become more and more like what God would have us to be, then we can move on up to baloney. And then from bologna on up to hamburgers. And then from hamburgers on to steaks. 
using food as a reference point here, a babe does not start out when he's he or she is born eating steak. They start off on the milk. And then as they grow and as they mature as a child, as a human being, then they begin to partake of different types of food, such as we are with as believers. You know, when I first became a believer at the age of 10 years old, I didn't start off learning Hebrew and, and Aramaic and Chaldean and Greek. I began learning the basics of Christianity. When we're going through the Gospels, learning what was right and what was wrong, learning those things that were important for me at that age so that as I would grow in time and God would call me into the teaching ministry and then later on into the pastoral ministry, that I would have the background that I needed. I would have the foundation laid that I could grow. And as, he, as Paul talks about this experiential state or nature here of sanctification, that's what he's referring to. During the time in which we are here on this earth, from the point of salvation to either the rapture of the church or our physical death on this plane of existence, that's the exper experiential uh, phase of our sanctification. Now, how we view that individually is up to us. But we know what God wants. He strives for us to be sanctified daily before Him. And then the third topic that we'll talk about is the ultimate status of sanctification. In John, 1 John 3, 2, he talks specifically about that because he's talking about eternity. 1 John 3, 2, he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for he shall see, we shall see him as he is. At that point in time when that great reunion takes place, when we all are in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, the sanctification, the ultimate sanctification will be fulfilled. Now here's a question that we have to ask ourselves, believers. What will our level of sanctification be when we get there? And true, we will be we'll be perfect because we will no longer have the sin nature inside of us. But what have we done during this ex experiential time in our lives to grow as a believer? What have we done to study God's word so that we can be the people that He desires so much for us to be? And I'm saying this, folks to all of us believers out there tonight. We have the time now to grow in grace. We've been talking about wisdom. We've been talking about Solomon and Proverbs, how he instructed us, as well as the people of his day, about the need for us to grow in wisdom, such as with sanctification, there's such a desire such a desire of God for us to be sanctified, but there's such a need in our lives as believers to be the sanctified believers that He's called us to be. So that we are able to teach others. So that we are able to lead others to Christ. So that we are able to discern those things that are right and wrong in this world. If we aren't educated in God's Word, if we're not truly sanctified the way He intends for us to be, how can we accomplish any of these things? How can we be pleasing before our Father and our Savior once we get to heaven, even though we'll be perfect because of what He done, not because of what we've done, but because of what He done when we get to that point? That's what He's saying here in verse 2. We will understand those things. But where will we be? I want to go back to 1 Thessalonians now as we continue to talk about this experiential phase of our sanctification in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4. I want you to hear this. 
For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, which we spoke about earlier, that ye should obtain, sub, should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. All right, let's talk about that for a second. He uses the term there, fornication. Now, why fornication? Fornication is a term that we're very familiar with as far as sexual immorality is concerned. And if we fall into fornication, then the sexual nature that God intended for us to be is, is it's not completely ruined, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's dirtied, okay? It is not sanctified like it was intended for it to be. So as he says here, should abstain from fornication, He's saying that we need to abstain from anything that would cause us not to be pure or holy before God. Again, talking to us as believers. This is what we need to understand. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification. Now, what's this vessel? We look at the vessel here. The vessel is the body of the believer. We've heard many, many times in the past about, you know, we are the church. Our body is the vessel of the Holy Spirit. And truly it is. Because as we look at Acts 9, 15, Paul talks a little bit further there about this vessel. And look what Jesus relates to Ananias here at this particular time, <clears throat> he says this, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Paul was a chosen sanctified vessel by God Almighty to fulfill his purpose in the times in which he lived. But not only then, but even in the times in which we live, because the words that Paul penned down so many years ago that was given to him, <clears throat> breathed into him by God Almighty, is relevant for our day-to-day. -day. So relevant for our day-to-day. -day. He says, Paul is a vessel. Paul is a body of sanctification for my glory, for my honor. We need to think about that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 talks a little bit more in depth about that. And as we look at those verses, it reads as follows. And, and here the question and the statement here that Paul makes, what? Talking to us as believers. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. These are some powerful words here. These are powerful, powerful words that God gave to Paul because he began to ask us the question, what? Don't you understand who you are as a born-again believer? I ask myself that. I ask all of you out there tonight, wherever you are, as believers, do we understand that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now think about that. What is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit we know of as the Comforter, as Christ said he would sin. But it's the third part of the Trinity, of God. And that's what resides inside of us. Okay? Church buildings. Man, we can make them pretty. We can make them beautiful. You go throughout the world and you see some of the great cathedrals and the churches around and the beauty and the splendor of these buildings, okay? We put so much effort into these buildings, 
shouldn't we take and put some of that effort into the building, the vessel that God is talking about here, the body of the believer, where the actual Holy Spirit resides? Hmm. So what are you trying to say, Brother Danny? I need to lose weight. I need to grow more hair. I need to put on more makeup. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, believers, talking to myself too. We need to understand the importance of keeping this vessel pure, holy, sanctified before God Almighty. That's our responsibility, folks. That's what we're supposed to do. And as he says here, he says, The Holy Spirit which is inside of you, which ye have of God, and you are not of your own. When we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, when God becomes our Father, we are no longer owners of ourselves. Okay? Before we were born again believers, we were servants of the devil because of that old sin nature inside of us. Yeah, we were created by God. Yes, we were breathed into us the breath of life by God. But we serve Satan. We serve Satan at that time. But once we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, a bond is formed and we become the total property of God. And Paul's saying, what? Don't you understand this? Don't you understand that you were bought with a price? That movie that came out a couple years ago, several years ago now, I reckon, about the passion of the Christ. Mel Gibson put that movie out. It was one of the best depictions of what our Savior went through while he was on this earth, even though it was not exact, it was close. So when we think about we were bought by a price, it wasn't just a regular price. It wasn't some 75 cents down at the, at the store buying some candy. This was the ultimate price. God the Son gave his life and paid the full price for us that we might be saved and then sanctified experientially all the days of our life. Believers tonight, I want us to really think about that. In the quiet of this evening, where you're at your home or wherever, wherever you're at, listen to, listen to the word tonight. We were bought with a price, a heavy price, a heavy price. It was the will of the Father because of the love that he has for all of the human race. If we are in that state of mind right now tonight as believers, that we're not living a sanctified life. That we have those things like we talked about this morning, those crutches in our lives that would harm this vessel that God has given us, we need to put those at the altar and walk away from them. Everybody knows their own individual life. You know what's going on. You know what types of things that are causing you not to have that sanctified life. We need to get rid of those things, folks. You want to see a change in our country? You want to see a change in our community? You want to see a change in this world? If we as believers will become the sanctified believers that God desires for us to be, He can work in a way beyond any comprehension. Without any comprehension. But we have to look into our individual lives and say, Am I living the sanctified life that he intends for me to? He paid for me. He bought me with that price, the ultimate price. And then he says, therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. And this ain't just talking about health and fitness and stuff like that, but that's part of it. And, and please uh, uh, don't don't get me wrong, cause I need to lose some weight myself. 
But if we strive to destroy our body, the vessel that God has given us, the physical vessel that he's given us, how does that bring glory to God? How does that bring glory to God? Yeah, I probably eat a few cookies more than I need to at night. Norma gets on to me about that and ice cream, whatever. But I don't take advantage of that. We shouldn't take advantage of that neither. And if we have that kind of problem, then we need to put it at the altar and ask God to give us the strength to overcome that. But not just eating. People that are taking medications that they shouldn't take, drinking alcohol that they shouldn't drink, doing anything that would harm the body. And I'm not going to step on toes necessarily, but and I know smoking is a horrible, horrible habit to break. Praise God, I've never even put one in my mouth, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say that. But smoking, taking in those things like that, there's so many things that we do to this vessel that we could do better. And hear me, believer, and even you lost people out there, if we totally believe and trust in God, he can help us with those crutches in our lives so that we can have the sanctified body that we need to have. But therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Now when he speaks of spirit here, he's talking about the spiritual realm, the spiritual aspects of our lives, the things that we say, the way that we visualize things around us. Do we visualize that in a godly spiritual way? Or a humanly spiritual way, worldly way. We need to have a new set of eyes. You know, I've preached sermons before and I've taught lessons about seeing through the eyes of Christ. This is a good point that can be made right here. Do we as believers tonight see through the eyes of Christ as we go through our daily lives? Or do we every once in a while see through his eyes? Believers, we need to strive that daily we see through the eyes of Christ. Because when we think about these things, the last part he says is, is which are God's. We are vessels as born again believers that belong to God. We are his. 100%. And if we know that we belong to God, believers 100%, shouldn't we strive to live a sanctified life? And I'm not talking about holier than thou. Again, please don't misunderstand me. But we need to be set apart from the rest of this world as the scriptures teach us to be sanctified to be set apart as God calls us to be, to be holy, to be pure before him. That's the least that we could do to give thanks to God for what he's done for us. So here's our challenge this week, believers. As we go throughout this week, let's, let's look in our lives and say where we can strive to be more sanctified as God would have us to be. Let's find those areas in our Christian life that needs to be put away. Place them on the altar, at your home, in your car, wherever you may be at work, if you can go back to work. But let us understand this, believers. We are called to be sanctified vessels before our Heavenly Father. And we don't know how much longer we've got on this earth. We don't know when the rapture is going to occur. We don't know when we're going to die of a physical death. But we do know this, that every moment that we have is another opportunity for us to be sanctified before God Almighty. So this will be my prayer tonight as we close in a few minutes that we strive to be the sanctified church so that we would bring honor and glory to our Heavenly Father. And if there's any out there tonight that are listening and have heard me talk about this sanctification for us as believers, 
I don't want to leave you out. You need to be sanctified too. Phase one, as we talked about here earlier, which is salvation. That moment in time when you accept Christ as Lord and Savior, you can begin that process even tonight. As we mention every sermon, the plan of salvation. You know, we think about John 3, 16, and how important that is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's talking to all of the human race, all that were ever born on the face of the earth. He desires for us to be saved. Though some of us have been. Praise God for that. Thank you for all you out there that are, that are saved already. I'm thank, thankful to God that I'm saved. But for those of you out there, I'll go ahead and call you my brothers and sisters, that don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that tonight is going to be that night for you. That you can begin that sanctification process. You can be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can live that experiential life to grow and to be the vessel that God would have you to be so that at some point in time when you leave and you and that ultimate sanctification takes place in heaven that you'll be pleasing in the sight of God so if you would right where you're at tonight let's just all bow for a word of prayer and Father as we uh, dismiss tonight I want to thank you so much for the opportunities in this life that you give us the opportunities as a human race to, first of all, to be saved, to have that first part, the very first step of sanctification, which comes through salvation, that only comes through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray for all my brothers and sisters out there tonight that don't know you, that tonight might be that night of salvation for them. And then for those of us that are believers, we understand what sanctification means, what your word teaches us about purity and holiness. Let us all do an evaluation into our hearts to see where we are, to find those crutches, to find those things that need to be placed at the altar, that need to be removed from our life, and pray to you that you would remove those things or help us remove those things that we be the sanctified believers you've called us to be. So Father, tonight, your blessings uh, I say thank you for, and I pray for each and every one that's been on the, uh, uh, the, the sermon tonight, that you might touch our hearts, that we might bring honor and glory to you. For in Christ's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for being here with us tonight. We, uh, we, we consider it a privilege as always to be able to proclaim God's word, to stand up for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we go through this week, uh, I encourage each and every one of you that are believers to uh, look in your life, as I will, to see what we can do to be uh, more sanctified, more what God would have us to be. And let's be an example for someone this week. Let's tell someone about Jesus Christ and about the plan of salvation. Let's help people understand that the world does not have the answers, that only God has the answers. Be blessed tonight and throughout this week. Be safe, and we'll be sending some messages out as the week goes by. And uh, y'all hope y'all have a wonderful, wonderful evening and a wonderful week. May God bless you.